All right, what is up? So today, we're gonna go into the book Following America, which technically isn't the one that follows it, uh, because Cool Memories follows it, but I'm not gonna be doing Cool Memories because that is, I guess it, it's just a journal, essentially, so it would be, it's too difficult to kind of draw any um, broad, you know, thematic themes from it. But for everyone listening, definitely go go check it out. There are some cool insights in there and some funny quips and short things that I guess make it make it a fun read and it's quick. And there, but there are five volumes over there between the years. Oh my God! Like between 1980 and 2005, I think there he released five cool memories, all of which are the same structure, pretty much all the same thing with some interesting insights all the way through. But for today, we're going to go into The Ecstasy of Communication. Now this book is a little bit um, strange because it's not a book per se. Uh, it was part of his, um, I guess, oh God, his, his um, academic portfolio, almost. So this book is kind of an overview of how Baudrillard perceived his work. So even for him, um, it's not as though there's there's a singular idea of what he thought. And this book is kind of his attempt to synthesize what he was thinking and to, I guess, consolidate something of a new point from which to depart. So, hence, you know, some people might consider this. I've heard arguments about how this is like a turning point and things get really... Uh, different following this, much more aphoristic, much more pataphysical, if you will. Um, but I don't, I don't personally see that. I don't think there's a, um, a consistent Baudrillard, nor do I see like different Baudrillards. I think it's like it's all very obscure <laughs> and difficult to locate any sort of um, connection across any number of his texts. But people can do that, and it's totally fine. So this text was originally uh, in the French titled L'Autre par lui-même, which would directly translate into the other by themselves. So L'Autre, the other, par, by, uh, lui-même, themselves, or them as they are. So he begins the book by saying that everything began with objects, yet there is no longer a system of objects. So this is a response clearly to his first book, the system of objects, where he's thinking about how things might have changed. So in the early Baudrillard, for those perhaps not so familiar, he was uh, very much influenced by thinkers like Henri, Henri Lefebvre, Bourdieu, other people like that, uh, that had an impact on how Baudrillard considered the world in relation to objects. Now for him, he's trying to rethink this. And what does it necessarily mean now to think of the world not in terms of objects that guide us, through something of a, a semi-Marxist type uh, type approach, but rather to think of the world differently. Now, what comes to take over this, in a sense, is this thing called hyperreality, or the meshing or the mingling of the subject and the object coming together. Whereas his early work still held on to the belief that there was a clear distinction between subjects and objects, which isn't to say that this distinction has totally disappeared, and he makes that clear. All this still exists as, exists, as he says, while it is simultaneously disappearing. Now what has happened is the, uh, um, oh my god, the folding onto one another of the subject and the object has come about through the development in, uh, I guess, information technology in some capacity, where he states that today the scene and the mirror have given way to a screen and a network. There is no longer any transcendence or any depth, but only the imminent surface of operations unfolding, the smooth and functional surface of communication. So this communication, in the way that he's describing it as being uh, smooth and functional, marks a distinction or marks a shift from just the idea of communication broadly. Now what I mean by that is that when two people interact with one another, it can be said that they are communicating. Now this is an important theme 
all throughout Baudrillard, where whenever he's talking about some kind of institution, whether it be simulation, hyperreality, reality, illusion, none of them imply something malevolent in and of themselves. And he makes distinctions, and they're they're rare, and they're few and far between, but they are crucial points, I find, when he states that there are two forms of each of those institutions. He doesn't use these terms, but they, there is an oppressive form and a non-oppressive form. The specific term he uses, though, when thinking about simulation, for instance, is conflictual and non-contradictory. So what Baudrillard is really worried about is the, um, I guess, the um, disappearance of the possibility of contradiction in favor of total operativity. Now, this form of communication that we find ourselves in, in the dissipation between the, in the relationship between subject and object, where we're all rendered objects in some way, and all rendered subjects in some way, marks that coming into being in almost, a, in his mind, um, hyper-real or perfect form. So in this system, as he states, there is no more power, no more speed, no more appropriation fantasies linked to the object itself, but a potential tactic linked to its use, mastery, control, and command, optimization of the game of possibilities, which the automobile offers as a vector, and no longer as a psychological sanctuary, resulting in the transformation of the subject himself into a driving computer, instead of the demiurge drunk with power, and it is this command, this, which is simply a drive towards uh, total functionality, or total whitewashing, if you will, that, that connotes this shift. Now this doesn't simply derive from our relationship to um, technologies that can be found in the home, like television, radio, cell phones, iPhones, you know, whatever you have here, but it comes down to the scientific domain as well, where Baudrillard says that because today everything is concentrated in the brain and the genetic code, which alone sum up the operational definition of being. So this is acts as a metaphor, I guess, for this general shift in, I guess, societal, this societal structure, where we have grown or a certain emphasis on a reality, that is, locating a reality within a certain biological determinism, coming down to the brain, coming down to one's physiology or their biology, that is part and parcel of this very system of I guess, trying to rid the world of contradiction, where with the right analytical tools, we can essentially find out the truths of the universe, or more simply, of the body, if that is simpler. So in the ecstasy of communication, we find ourselves no longer, as he says, in the drama of alienation, but we are in the ecstasy of communication. So at one time for him, there was something, and he romanticizes this, and he is a nostalgic thinker, which in my mind is certainly one of his limitations. But he states that yet it is also contained, or sorry, yet it also contained the symbolic benefit of alienation, the fact that the other exists, and that otherness can be played out for better or for worse. This marks, or at least this was indicative of the pre-ecstasy of communication age where people were, I guess, separated to some extent. Now, how he understands it now, and this is very much in the same vein as, as Virilio. So Virilio says, and, and there's, um, there's a really short, nice short piece that sums this up called the, the Last Vehicle, where he essentially argues that with our ability to travel, with our ability to move very quickly, the world has essentially shrunk. Now, this doesn't actually only happen at the physical level, where physical bodies are able to move from place to place at, at a hyper-real speed, or at hyperspeed, but also our connection to media, i.e. watching films, does the same thing. Now, here's an example, one that I believe he gives. If someone is on an airplane, not only are they physically moving to a place at a rate that's not particularly human, but, let's say on that flight, they're watching a film. Now let's say on this flight, this is a flight from New York to, I don't know, 
Beijing. On this flight, they're watching a movie uh, that takes place in Paris. So this marks almost like a triple displacement, where one is not only, or a double displacement, where one is not only moving their physical body, but their mental body is also in another part of the world. So it is this idea where everything is brought to us like that, that marks a sort of instantaneity, instantaneity. It becomes instantaneous, and in that way, at least for Virilio and Baudrillard, brings the world together. Now communication does the exact same thing. So when he said that we no longer partake in the drama of alienation, we are essentially, that, that is because everything is brought so close. No one is ever really alone. And he makes a very important distinction between this idea of communication and the spectacle. So what he states in this book, and this is really important because many people tend to uh, locate Baudrillard in the same vein as the Situationists, like Guy Debord and the Society of the Spectacle, where Baudrillard is not really interested in that idea at all. In fact, he says, if anything, we've moved beyond this idea of the spectacle. As he says, thus the consumer society was lived under the sign of alienation. It was a society of the spectacle, but at least there was a spectacle. And the spectacle, even if alienated, is never obscene. Whereas the ecstasy of communication, as we can understand it, is obscene. So for him, he defines obscenity as follows. Obscenity begins when there is no more spectacle, no more stage, no more theater, no more illusion. When everything becomes immediately transparent, visible, exposed in the raw and inexorable light of information and communication. So this is an idea that he builds upon from Fatal Strategies in 1983 in which he argues that obscenity is when things are brought to their nth power, when things are driven to be more than themselves, more real than real, more of themselves than themselves, that they become obscene. And in obscenity, there it does not allow for the theater of the spectacle. There is no more illusion, there is no more drama, everything is made totally, as he says, transparent. Everything is made visible. So in the face of all of this, we attempt to craft certain narratives of meaning. So certain narratives of belonging, certain narratives of reality in some way. As he states, what matters above everything else is proving our existence, even if that is its only meaning. And we surround ourselves with discourses around existence, around reality, that are intended to convince us, at least for Baudrillard, that we have not lost anything. So there is, um, and this is really difficult to reconcile, because it would seem as though the opposite were the case, where it seems as though today, maybe there's something to be said about how even Baudrillard's work here might be outdated, but there is a certain discourse today floating around about the alienating te effects of like technology and how everyone is brought closer together and how that is necessarily bad and you can find any number of YouTube videos you know any other blogs or whatever explaining this phenomenon how people are essentially you know they sit in their beds with their iPhones instead of talking to people and how that is bad and moving people away and it almost suggests that people are becoming aware of this to which I would respond that no that in fact, that very discourse implies there having been at one time a consolidated, um, um, non-alienated human. Whereas Baudrillard is saying that no, in fact, alienation is what we really, you know, what gives us something of a humanity, a being alone, a being of oneself. So the discourse going around today, at least that I've, I've seen, and it's more complicated than this, but that I've seen, deals specifically with the problem of the alienating effects of technology, implying that we can get to some sort of pre-alienated stage, whereas for Baudrillard it would be the opposite. For him, we, we aren't alienated, and it would do us well to go back to a state of alienation. And the Marxists probably want to rip their hair out and dislike this video and it'll be fucking piece of shit but uh yeah
Sorry, excuse my swearing. So a perfect example of this is sexuality, and it's something that I bring up a lot, and just beating a dead horse at this point. But he speaks about it specifically here, saying that sexuality is but a ritual of transparency. So remember, transparency has that connection with obscenity, which has that connection with the ecstasy of communication. Where he continues, Where once it had to be hidden, hidden. Sexuality today hides what little remains of reality, and of course, participates in all of this disembodied passion. So we hear we hear Foucault in this as well. Uh, we think of the kind of explosion of the discourse around sexuality at a certain point, um, with the with advent of certain, I guess, medical sciences or medical techniques around the body that sought to give a name to everything. Hence the DSM whatever number. However, following the sentiment, he makes an interesting claim that no one can say if sex has been liberated or not or whether the rate of sexual pleasure has increased. In sexuality, as in art, the idea of progress is absurd. However, obscenity and transparency progress ineluctably because they no longer partake in the order of desire but in the order of the frenzy of the image. So it is this rendering things images that demands some clarification, where it would seem as though Baudrillard is, well, he appears to be, um, I guess, holds some degree of animosity towards this phenomenon. Whereas I would say that it's more complicated than that, because the image is, in a sense, what has always been, where we have always existed at the level of the image. And we can think back to Plato for this one, like in the Republic towards the end, when he's laying out the three forms of uh, representation, which could very well just be three forms of simulation, we are always within that framework. So, so in that way, we have to be weary about considering Baudrillard a thinker of either against or for images, either against or for simulation, and really try to sift out the complexities of those terms. Because as he tells us, Fortunately, the destiny of things protects us, for at their culmination, as they about to verify their existence, they always undo themselves and thereby plunge back into the secret. Now this is what objects do. For Baudrillard, there is a sort of magical quality to objects that always wrest subjects out of their privileged position and throw them back into something of an unknown position. That is because our relationship to objects over the course of time, and this is something that he, you know, he struggles with as a thinker, and he tries to, he goes to various places to try and, um, I guess, untangle this idea, like mouse, and the idea of the gift, and what the object does in there, and the idea of sacrifice. He goes to these different ideas in order to try and give the object not necessarily a privileged position over the subject, but to try and retain the ambiguity of the object's position in relation to the subject, which then throws the subject into itself an ambiguous position, effectively wresting it from the, what I will call, oppressive image of that thing. So an image, or the repressive image, or the oppressive image that I believe Baudrillard is speaking about is the one that consolidates the one that crystallizes a thing and freezes it makes, it, makes it true or makes it real. Whereas for Baudrillard, he's more interested in the image that is allowed to change, allowed to develop over time. And the object is a perfect way to do that because the object for him has been always been an ambiguous sort of non-thing, if I can use that term. And of course, then, the object has some kind of affinity with seduction. So seduction is that thing for Baudrillard that allows things to be wrested from their subject position or from their privileged, posi privileged position and to be taken and thrusted into the unknown. So in his... And I'm, this is kind of a summary of all his work because that's kind of what this book is. But seduction follows reversibility in his early work. So reversibility suggests a chiastic movement, so a movement from one side of a 
binary, I'll use the binary example, uh, to another. Where, you know, um, I guess between, let's take gender, where if we just work with the gender binary of um, men and women, these two things can reverse into one another, essentially obscuring the idea of the binary itself. Whereas seduction is a little bit more complex. Seduction implies that that is occurring, but at the same time, these ideas on either side of the binary are being thrusted into different and unknown positions that always then create new, um, that, uh, new conflicts with the other side of the binary. So as he states it here, he says that the power of metamorphosis is at the root of all seduction, including the most shifting forms of substitution, those of faces, roles, and masks. It is with a metamorphosis that we shroud every seduction. It is with a ceremonial that we shroud every metamorphosis. This is the law of appearances, and the body is the first object caught in this game. So the play of appearances here allows for a sort of fluidity that is important for Baudrillard because it, it takes things out of their um, crystallization or their solidification into new and unknown territory. Now, there is a distinction to be made between this suggestion and like the Deleuzean, Guattarian notion of like deterritorialization, where this can't be mobilized. Where in a thousand plateaus, Deleuze and Guattari say, you know, deterritorialize yourself, like find new subject positions, like you are multiplicities, like embrace that. Baudrillard never says like this is something that the subject or the whoever or whatever is engaging in this can ever be aware of. Rather, it is something that always occurs at them from an unknown position. It's not as, and it's not as though someone else is doing it to someone else, or something is doing it to another thing, because that would give it too much of a, of a face. And it's for that reason that is, it is against production and lies much more on the side of the mystery, or the illusion, or the secret, which are all important terms. So the ultimate goal then for Baudrillard is to, in a sense, disappear. Now this is, again, this isn't something that someone can sim simply take on, but rather it comes about when, when there has been a kind of acceptance of the lack of possibility that someone can make for themselves. So as he states, for passing from one species to another, from one form to another, is a means of disappearing, not of dying. To disappear is to disperse oneself in appearances, and dying does not do any good. One must still know how to disappear. Living doesn't do any good. One must still seduce. And it would sound like this is contradicting what I stated about not being able to um, mobilize one's ability to seduce. But I, I, will, I still hold on to what I said because it, if it's something that could be mobilized, then it would be something that has a face that could be understood. And that is really wrong in how we understand this, or I think as we should understand this, but I'd be super curious if someone had another, um, another opinion on that, and I'd really like to hear about it. So to give a little bit more on this thing called seduction, he states that seduction is not a theme which stands in opposition to others, or puts an end to others. Seduction is what seduces, and that's that. To begin with, almost a pun, we are told that everything relies on production, what if everything relied on seduction? A pun is always a challenge, and in the triumphant era, era of production, the mere allusion to seduction also assumes the role of a theoretical challenge. Challenge, and not desire, lies at the heart of seduction. Challenge is that to which one cannot avoid responding, while one can choose not to respond to desire. Desire takes you beyond all contracts, beyond the law of exchange, beyond equivalences in a bidding which may have no end. Far more than the pleasure principle, it is a challenge, or it is challenge and seduction, which draws us beyond the reality principle. Seduction is not that which is opposed to production, it is that which seduces production. So I know I said earlier, it is that which opposes production, and that is something that he says in seduction. He's a very difficult person to read. But what he's 
saying here, and I want to kind of sift out this idea of the challenge, um, because I, I think it's important. Uh, the challenge is that which, when he says that it's that which someone can, mu they must respond to, what he's doing then is kind of uh, laying out or suggesting the objectification of subjects in some way, where they are taken out of their, I guess, their belief in, or their individuality, or their belief in their own autonomy, and thrusted into the world of the object, where they, and this is all, this all floats around the idea that we have of objects that aren't autonomous, that are simply to be used by subjects, yada yada yada, and he's playing with that a little bit. So that is what we become in the mode or it the it the moment of seduction. It it the moment. Sorry. And as he makes very clear, seduction is the world's elementary dynamic. Gods and men were not separated by the moral chasm of religion. They continuously played the game of mutual seduction. The symbolic equilibrium of the world is founded on these relations of seduction and playfulness. So the reason that he says that this is what allows things to come into being, or, sorry, the reason why he says that this is the elementary condition of existence or of the world is because it is, seduction is that which allows things to come into being, whereas production is that which forces things into being, which can only go so far. And that is why production will always work within, will only work within the parameters of a certain, um, formulation within a certain binary within a certain structure whereas seduction is that which allows things to go beyond in a sense to move away from themselves away from the lexic you know the lexical field that determines them into new and untraversed territory i don't know how many times i've said that but there you have it this is difficult to talk about seduction then exists as baudrillard states as a mastering of the reign of appearances which opposes power, which is a mastering of the universe of meaning. So power, like production, is that which can exist in any given moment, and it is because it works within the parameters of that given time, that epoch. Seduction is that which allows the epochs to change, right? And allows the conditions to change and alter. So his fundamental project, then, is to bring things back to the, well, back, I don't want to use that term, but to, to make things, to make the world aware of seduction or appearances in the construction of meaning or in the movement of anything, in how things change and develop. So as he says, I am merely seeking to regain a space for the secret. Seduction being simply that which lets appearance circulate and move as a secret. Now this is why seduction opposes almost all of the discourse that floats around today around meaning, around identity, around anything that su suggests there to be some kind of truthful um, aspect to it, whether it reduces it to some kind of like biological certainty or, or a cultural one, even though, you know, I personally would side with the latter. Seduction opposes all of this because it only believes in the possibility for things to not be true. Or at best, for truth to always, always, always be veiled behind a secret. Where it can only ever be that thing that can never be attained. And on a side note, there is a lot of Lacan in here. Um, it's difficult to know like, how much Baudrillard or what kind of what Baudrillard really thought of Lacan? He's kind of, he comes up a few times throughout his work, but this kind of rendering object, or the wanting to become object, really thinks well or jives well with Lacan's idea of the um, the um, being being the object of someone's desire, where people want to kind of disappear in their being rendered um, object to someone else, where they can then, I guess, let go of themselves and be at the will of someone else. So the last section of this uh, this book um, is called Why Theory? 
Now I had to read this long ago. It's one of my first kind of forays into Baudrillard, and it makes absolutely no sense if you like without reading the rest of this book or without reading most of his other texts. So it's a tricky one, but it kind of lays out how he thinks about theory and how he thinks about writing, which for him are important elements to the possibility for seduction to, to remain alive or the mystery to remain alive. So what he states about theory is, or the first thing goes as follows, to be the reflection of the real, to enter into a relation of critical negativity with the real cannot be theory's end. This was the pious vow of a perpetuated era of enlightenment, and to this day it determines the moral standing of the intellectual. Today, however, this appealing dialectic seems unsettled. What good is theory? If the world is hardly compatible with the concept of the real which we impose upon it, the function of theory is certainly not to reconcile it, but on the contrary, to seduce to wrest things from their condition, to force them into an over-existence which is incompatible with that of the real. Theory pays dearly for this in a prophetic auto-destruction. So what are you speaking to here? And this is what he kind of lays out in Symbolic Exchange and Death from 76, 77, is his critique to critical theory, where he Baudrillard is trying to imagine the possibility of a radical theory. Now, what does that mean? Honestly, I have no idea, but I'm going to try to lay it out a little bit. Where critical theory, indicative of the work of Marx, Foucault, Freud, for Baudrillard, and he kind of goes runs through each, how each of them don't adequately identify the, the, the source of the, I guess, the ailments that they seek to identify. So, in Marx, instead of challenging capital, because he was kind of pushing this, um, this universalist uh, humanism, actually mirrors capital for Foucault, where Foucault, even as a individually, in his personality, came to mirror the same kind of power he described. And as in Freud, it's a little bit more complicated. Baudrillard just kind of saw the idea of the unconscious as being silly. And there's a lot more to that. I just don't want to spend a lot of time on that. For Baudrillard, what we have, or what he's trying to craft out instead, is a radical theory that doesn't try to understand the world through some kind of genealogical method, or some discourse around, like, the origin of history, or some discourse around um, the location of all derives in some kind of universal unconscious apparatus, but rather he wants to think about how theory can make the world more enigmatic, can make it more confusing, because for him, I can't remember where he states this, he says, like, the true task of philosophy is to make the world more complicated, you know, because answers are boring, and there, there are too many answers, like, we need more questions in this world, but that is a, essentially what he means by a radical theory, or moving beyond critical theory, but another term that he uses is a uh, fatal so fatal theory or fatal strategies that push things to their kind of logical conclusions, that drive ideas beyond themselves in order for them to not only come to terms with the parity of themselves and to understand that no, there is no meta-theory, there is no um, meta-meta-narrative, that we must, or at least one of the strategy he proposes is by driving things to this, these conclusions or the possibility for their conclusion allows for new things to come into being. Whether, but, you know, he takes a, this is where some people read a cynicism in him where it's like, oh, well, either, either it's total nuclear destruction or it's kind of, um, kind of a stasis, uh, where people are like at the end of Wally kind of floating in those, uh, or not the end, in the film Wally, the Pixar film, people are floating around in those chairs. I, it seems to be one or the other. Um, but yeah, I think like this will be a pretty short one. Uh, I don't see much more point to ramble on about this text. It's good. It's it's difficult. I wouldn't recommend starting with it for anyone who's you know at all interested. For the few people that actually listen to these. Uh, 
videos or these episodes here. It starts somewhere else, but it's certainly a good one to check out because it does synthesize some of his more complicated ideas and, and makes them a little bit more uh, digestible. But on that note, for any of those that made it this far, for any of those that have um, any questions or comments or criticisms, like please level them against me in the in the comments section. Um, but yeah, for now.